we are now moving into the first uh, paper presentation session, which is a thematic session entitled Language Resources and Clarion Centers. We have three presentations in this session, and they are sort of back to back in the space of one hour. So in the interest of time, I would like to invite the first presenter, uh, which who will present, who, who is from Ghent University, I hope, and who will present <laughs> a, a, a paper called Ector 1. I've annotated corpora for term extraction research. You can introduce yourself, I hope. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ayla, and I will indeed be continuing our talk about corpora. In this sense, I will be talking about the corpora, the annotated corpora I created during my PhD research at Ghent University with the language and translation technology team. Since then, I've transferred to KU Leuven uh, University, which is why there's a double affiliation over here. This is research in collaboration with Veronique Hoste and Els Lefebvre at the LT3 team. So, uh, is here this one? So just to make sure we're all on the same page, by terminology, I just mean the specialized vocabulary that can express the main specific concepts through single or multi-word terms. So examples of terms in uh, computational linguistics could be um, recurrent neural network or something like that. And this terminology is very important because translators spend a lot of their time working on terminology activities, so researching their terms to make sure they can find a good cross-lingual equivalent uh, because these terms are so domain specific and they contain a lot of information. So also getting the terms right really has a big impact on the quality of a text. And then we also know that in NLP, uh, the solutions are often struggling with domain specific texts partly due to this terminology. So automatic term extraction is one of the things we can use to help with the processing of uh, domain specific text and terminology. It is basically the first step, just identifying the terms in the text. Traditionally, this is usually done uh, as in the image on the right-hand side of the screen, where you can just see a list of potential terms, Canada terms in the text. And nowadays you also have more uh, methodologies that work where you identify the terms in the text in their original context as in the other image here on the screen. So for my PhD, I've been researching machine learning approaches to automatic term extraction, because for a long time we were just using the rule-based approaches where you would usually start by linguistically pre-processing a text. So using tokenization, lemmatization, part of speech tagging to process a text. Then extracting candidate terms, potential terms, by part of speech patterns. For instance, you would say that, okay, a combination of a noun plus another noun can be a term, so I'm extracting these from the text. And then from these Canada terms, you would further filter them using statistics by calculating termhood and unithood, for instance, to uh, compare frequencies in a domain specific and a general news corpus to see whether a term would occur more often in a domain specific corpus. Now, for my PhD, I researched machine learning approaches to do this. First of all, I had a feature-based approach where I sort of transferred this whole hybrid methodology I just briefly explained into a machine learning approach with a random forest classifier, where I also identified Canada terms based on part of speech, calculated a whole bunch of different uh, features for them. For instance, this, uh, the length of the term, but also the frequencies in the different corpora and then try to classify each Canada term as either a term or not. But I also used a different approach, a recurrent neural network where I went into the text and really went over each token in context to say, is this token part of a term or not? And going over each token in turn. Now to do all of this, I of course needed data to learn from because these were supervised machine learning approaches, which meant that I spent a whole lot of my PhD annotating. And uh, well, anyone who's ever annotated knows that maybe it's not always seen as the most interesting task, but it does teach you as a lot about your data. Um, and it also gives you something to present here at Clarin. So uh, ACTOR stands for Annotated Corpora for Term Extraction Research. Just to be clear, corpora here, I just mean collections of texts. We'll talk more about this uh, 
in the next slides as well. And maybe the most important thing or characteristics about this corpus is that it is really annotation based on human intuition, not on computer capabilities. So really when I'm identifying the terms in a text, I'm not thinking about how difficult this term will be to identify automatically, but just as a linguist, as a human, as a uh, someone with a background in translation, do I want this term? Does this seem like a term? Um, I also had annotation guidelines, of course, and validated these through inter-annotator agreement studies. And you can see a screenshot of what the annotations look like below. Now, terms look very different in different domains and different languages. So to make sure that this data set could really be used for more general research on terminology and not just on English medical terminology, I made sure to include different uh, types of corpora. So I worked in the languages English, French, and Dutch, and I had corpora on corruption, heart failure, wind energy, and dressage, so horse riding. Quite different domains, as you can see, so really, if you test something on this data set, you know that the methodology will either work or not in very different types of uh, settings. Now, besides the different settings, I also looked at different labels for terms because just saying term or not feels a little bit restrictive. As we all know, it feels a bit wrong to give the same label to a term like heart and to ejection fraction. Somehow that doesn't quite feel right. So I defined two axes uh, on which to define the terms, lexicon specificity and domain specificity. With lexicon specificity, I mean that how much uh, domain expertise do you need to understand the term or do lay people also understand it? And then domain specificity would be how much is it related to a specific domain. To make this a little bit more uh, clear here, I've given some examples in the domain of heart failure so I just talked about ejection fraction. I really hope none of you, unless you have a medical background, know what this means, because it would mean that you might have had some issues here. Uh, so ejection fraction has something to do with the volume of blood a heart pumps in a single beat. I don't know this as a layperson. It is clearly something to do with heart failure. So it is a specific term. It is both lexicon specific and domain specific. On the other hand, you also have a term like heart, even the uh, small primary school children have at least a basic idea of what a heart is. So even though our knowledge is not the same as a domain specialist, we have a basic idea. We can say that this is understandable to lay people, but it is also very much related to the domain of heart failure. On the other hand, we also have the out of domain terms. So if my, my corpus on heart failure, they are talking about the statistics and talking about a p-value. You do need some domain knowledge to understand the p-value, but it's not in the domain of heart failure specifically. And then while I was already annotating, I figured I'd also annotate the named entities uh, because of course they have a lot in common with the terms. And like I said, I was annotating anyway, so I might as well include them. So another screenshot here of uh, how these annotations look. I annotated in the Brad Rapid annotation tool. You can see that I have nested annotations. So not just heart failure as a whole is annotated, but also a heart nested. And uh, each occurrence of each term is annotated as well. The first release of this data set was in 2020 in the context of a shared task, the term of all shared task at CompuTerm. And since then I've been gradually improving the data set with general improvements like um, I know, including the labels and not just the annotations themselves, um, having improvements on removing very long or not very good annotations and so on. And then the last uh, update, Actor 1.5, which I'm talking about here, has an important uh, addition, which is the sequential annotations. So because of this evolution to, from more feature-based machine learning towards the neural machine learning and the recurrent neural networks, we see that people are working more with sequential data um, and we need this, these annotations as well because I want people to be able to use the data set as is to be working with the same data and compare results and not having to somehow derive the sequential data from the non-sequential data I would put online. So how uh, can you now access the data set? So this is one of the formats in which the data is available. These are simply the lists of all of the terms that have been annotated, tab separated by their label, just in um, alphabetic order. But you can also access the sequential annotations. 
So here you can see remote ischemic conditioning for patients with heart failure. Each first word of an annotation gets the B label for a beginning. Each subsequent word of the same annotation is an I for insight. And if a word is not part of any annotation, it gets an O. Of course, there are some restrictions here. I cannot annotate my nested annotations, but I wanted to keep the, uh, the labeling scheme here relatively simple. Now the correspondence with the original annotations gets very complicated quickly. It's documented um, in a different uh, publication. So if you're interested, you can find all of the technicalities there as well. But the main thing is that people now also have the sequential data set so you can all work on the same uh, data. Some of the numbers here. So you can see I have uh, data in all the four domains, three languages. The number of documents, sentences, and so on differs per language uh, and per domain. Uh, all of the corporal and dressage, heart failure, and wind energy are comparable, and the corruption corpus is parallel, meaning that the corruption corpus consists of translations between the different languages. The other corpora have a different, um, are not direct translations, but they do have the same style, the same topic, uh, the same length, approximately, and so on. You can see that in total, there were on, almost 19,000 annotations. These are type counts, so uh, individual annotations, there were over 100,000. Um, and they're divided a little bit over all of the categories with the fewest out of domain terms, which is logical because of course the corpora are supposed to be really about one domain. And then with the IOB numbers, I made a small mistake here. The first uh, one should be the O. So the outside should be the largest category, sorry. Um, and you can see that it's sparse in that sense that 80 to 90% of the tokens in a text are not terminological and only the remainder are. So with this data set, I didn't only create the data set, but I also created a demo based on the methodologies for term extraction I developed with this data, which is freely available online. Fair warning, it's a small demo of uh, the research group. So if you all go on there right now, I'm afraid it's probably gonna crash, but at least you have the link this way uh, and I hope it will work. Of course, if anyone uh, tries it out and there are issues, please contact me because we are always working to improve it. With this demo, you can um, extract terms automatically from monolingual text, just a simple TXT file. You can see them either as a list or in the original context, but you can also perform bilingual term extraction from a TMX file. So from a translation memory, you can also uh, extract the terms into languages and find the cross-lingual equivalents. So this is freely available online. This has been it for my talk for today. I, uh, if you have any questions, of course, I'm welcome. I'm free to answer them. Thank you. Uh, so there's plenty of time for questions. Are there questions? Yes. Yes, thank you very much for your talk. Um, Interesting, and uh, I, I, uh, it seems that your results are quite quite good. Uh, I have a question regarding, well, in a way, linking back to this uh, library uh, um, talk. So we do have in, in libraries uh, lots of resources with indexes uh, at the end of the books. So in a way, you have a terminology uh, already um, somewhere there. Uh, have you also thought about taking these uh, uh, specific terms that are available in libraries uh, to help you for the annotation of, of your terms? Yes, we, so we considered various ways of getting to these terms. Uh, the problem is with uh, the indexes at the backs of books, some are already automatically generated and some do not, of course, contain all of the terms in there. So for this data set, we really wanted to have at least one data set where we could really say that all of the terms in the text, human, uh, accounting for human error, of course, would be annotated uh, so that you could really see if your system finds a term and it's not in your gold standard, that is really a question of, okay, um, it, it's not a term and the other way around as well, that if it doesn't find a term, it should have. 
uh, with the problem with indexes, of course, is if it finds a term and it's maybe not in the index, that's no guarantee that it's not in the book because it might just be a term that is mentioned once, but it's not very relevant. But of course, these indices can be a good uh, starting point to develop more, to have more access to larger data sets, because this is, in terms of computational linguistics, a relatively small data set still. Um, so it can also, you can go, for instance, train a system on the indexes and then use this as an evaluation set. Okay, thank you. Here's another question from Lars Arenberg. Yeah, okay. Thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, I wonder, I mean, it seems you have done a lot of annotation work. In my experience, when you do annotate terminology, you need not only a linguist, but also a domain expert. So, so have domain experts been involved in the production of this corpus? Yes, so for the medical corpus, I did consult a domain expert every once in a while, not uh, for every annotation. And then the uh, inclusion of the dressage domain was actually to uh, have an answer to this question because I was always one of those horse girls that you have in every class. So I decided, okay, I'm a domain expert in this sense. Uh, and I found that for the annotation, it was not necessarily more easy for me to annotate in this domain because it was more difficult to estimate, like, is this general knowledge or is it just because I've been involved in this world that I think this is a self-evident term? Does everyone know what trot is, Aaron and Gallup? And so it wasn't always easier to annotate just because I had domain knowledge in that domain. Are there more questions? Well, I have one, in fact. So uh, I was wondering when I read this, because it's sort of not it's it's a bit away from my own expertise. So, what what kinds of research uh, will this resource support, or or does it support even? So, for now, the research is, for instance, what I uh, show in the demo. So, the uh, indication of terminology, which can, for instance, be useful for translators. And uh, follow-up research would, for me, be uh, to also be able to do this for, with comparable corpora. So corpora in different languages that are not aligned, that are not direct translation, being able to identify the terms, and then also being able to suggest cross-lingual equivalence. Because, for instance, if you're um, an interpreter and you need to go and interpret at a conference for dentistry, but you don't have any knowledge about dentistry or of the terminology there, uh, and there's no like standard list of terms in two languages on dentistry, then this could be a way of uh, automatically just getting an, uh, a corpus because comparable corpora can be compiled relatively easily and getting just an idea of what types of terms are used, what might be equivalent terms, just as a preparation step, for instance. Okay, thank you very much. And unless there's a short question, we conclude. Thank the speaker once again. Good evening, my name is Claudia Soria. I'm a researcher at the National Council of Italy. The Institute for Computational Linguistics, and this is a joint work with uh, Silvia Calamai from the University of Siena, who's also in the room, and Rosalba Nodari, and in, uh, Alessandro Carlucci from the University of Bergen in Norway. And we're going to talk about a new resource we uh, are about to develop for in the, in the framework of CLAR in Italy, uh, linguistic autobiographies. So what is a linguistic autobiography. So it's a very specific type of text. First of all, it's a narrative, non-fictional text, where another explicitly recalls his or her life from the point of view of the relationship with languages. So for instance, mother tongue, languages learned at school, dialects, uh, heritage languages, you name it. So the, the, the idea behind this, behind the, 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 the concept of linguistic autobiography is that uh, um, the acquisition of selfhood really happens through acquisition and interaction of different languages. So the key element of a linguistic autobiography is the strong, very strong emphasis on uh, the linguistic component. And here is how 
it looks like when they are collected, because typically linguistic autobiographies are collected in educational settings in the classroom. So they are provided on piece of papers and they look like that. And to give you an idea about the content and not only the form, here is an example on the left, you see the original text in Italian, on the right is uh, the beginning, the start of uh, such an autobiography. Say my name is Silvia, I was born in Florence uh, and so on and so forth. Um, then I started talking about um, the, the, the languages spoken in the family. Mine has been a monolingual family, my father from Calenzano with a rustic dialect and so on. My mother from Quarrata and with a more bourgeois and correct dialect. So that's the, the basic idea. The text, texts are collected, um, not freely. So people are not left completely free of talking about uh, their relationship with languages, but they're given a template, they're given a script. And uh, uh, the script is, um, so they are suggested to talk about family members, personal data, the family linguistic background, uh, the situation uh, of the family with regards um, to languages, uh, the, the attitudes and behaviors of family and the school towards languages. Uh, when was the first approach and meeting when they realized uh, that uh, linguistic diversity was uh, actually um, something, something happening around them and uh, learning the, the languages learned in, in school, either in informal or in informal settings and so on and so forth. Um, why linguistic autobiographies? So it's... Uh, um, uh, they are considered a very powerful, versatile, and important tool, especially in educational settings. First of all, because they are quite easy. Uh, it's a specific, it's a type of test that's quite easy to collect because it doesn't require any specific or uh, academic training. It's also considered as a very helpful tool, uh, both from the pedagogical and from the research point of view. As a pedagogical tool, it helps students to really develop a linguistic, a meta-linguistic and meta-pragmatic ability to reflect about um, languages and to talk about them. And also to, for students to narrate, to express uh, about their um, multilingual selves and make, uh, in, especially in uh, recent settings where a lot of pupils come from, um, have a, a migration background, also to uh, give value, to, to, to value, give prominence to, to the language they speak in the family. They're also important for the teachers because they help them understand their uh, several things. Uh, of course, the, the linguistic, uh, the real linguistic backgrounds of the students, but also their linguistic, their learning process, their practices in learning languages and the motivation behind them. And, um, also their needs and expectations. So it's very, very, very in, uh, important and useful. From the point of view of research, uh, these kind of uh, narratives help linguists in gaining access to ideologies and attitudes about languages and towards about main languages, state languages, but also language varieties and variation. We also believe that um, these texts bring also up societal potential in the sense that for policymakers and stakeholders uh, can really help understand how ideologies about languages can have an influence on the linguistic behavior of the speakers. And also as well, they um, help understand uh, the motivation of students regarding language learning. And this can help develop and devise specific school curricula for addressing uh, the needs, the communicative needs of the students. So in the, the, the Italian and Norwegian teams have collected uh, around 300 um, texts of this type coming from different educational settings. 
uh, from um, university students, from secondary school to students uh, in particular, both uh, from uh, L1 and L2 speakers. So for the specific part of the Italian corpus, so we've got around 200 linguistic autobiographies collected during university linguistic courses, autobiographies of secondary students, and also 40 autobiographies of secondary school teachers. So uh, in this context, our interest is um, first to build a multilingual corpus of this specific genre, this specific type of text, but also to encourage the production of new material. And for this uh, purpose, we, also, uh, we will also provide a multilingual template that will be made available to the Clarion community to facilitate the collection of linguistic autobiographies. But also we are very much interested in uh, uncover the material that is already there, that is being used in schools by teachers, by researchers, and uh, well, it, it remains uh, really un undiscovered because uh, we, we, we know that this is a, a tool that is being used in, uh, in, in schools. So we want to uncover that material. We want to bring it to, to the light and enhance its re reusability for um, general purpose. So this uh, is uh, one, uh, um, uh, one goal, but on the other hand, we also um, want to uh, start thinking about uh, building a new resource family on the very broad issue and topic of linguistic reflexivity, because linguistic autobiographies are a specific type of text that revolves around reflection about languages, but we are also aware that so there are other resources already existing, other types of texts that are already there that touch upon same or similar issues. For instance, having a look at the VLO, we uh, have discovered ling language biographies that are already present, for instance, for Italian. And these are partly different and partly similar. So they are, these are transcriptions of oral interviews and uh, they are, uh, they, have uh, uh, similar topics, of course, a similar approach, not entirely the same, they don't follow the same structure, but they could reveal, them, reveal very interesting for uh, the purposes of linguistic uh, reflexivity. And to this end, we would like to um, bring this component of linguistic reflexivity to the fore and um, build a resource family that collects both and allows to compare and confront the different uh, types of text. But there are also other types of resources such as this one, um, which are called linguistic silhouette. This is a, um, an exercise that is typically carried out in schools and can be carried out and especially targeting uh, uh, very young students, young pupils uh, from um, elementary primary school or thanks or um, secondary school. And uh, here the, the, the subject is asked to, to, to draw um, um, uh, themselves and to attach uh, uh, the languages that they know about, they either speak or, or form part of the linguistic environment to a different part of the body. So in general, the, the mother tongue is associated with the heart and then we have uh, other languages associated, for instance, with the head. Here, uh, here for instance, uh, we have uh, Latin or uh, what else? There's French because they are the difficult ones. But uh, you see that English is associated with legs because it allow English allows you to uh, go around to travel the world, and also it's a useful language. So it, it, it's a really revealing tool about. Uh, what are the ideologies and attitudes associated with the different languages um, with young speakers and young pupils? So, um, of course, uh, the um, issue of building a resource family touches upon the very the, the crucial issue of um, 
selecting and adopting very um, accurate and appropriate metadata that satisfy different uh, um, criteria, most, uh, most important of them, exhaustiveness to maximize the impact on the traceability of the resources, but also uh, allowing to um, compare the resources being described with uh, resources that are similar in content or uh, might be different in genre or other um, points of view. And to conclude, um, the potential applications of this kind of uh, resource and resource family are um, manifold. We believe that um, the collection and curation of such material would offer um, a very important resources, resource. Um, and we can, uh, both from the point of view of uh, um, as a didactic, as an educational tool and uh, uh, as a research tool, as a didactic and educational tool uh, could provide uh, teaching material to raise awareness about uh, heritage languages, accentism, glottophobia, and help teacher to better understand the languages that are most used and known in a given classroom. And also, uh, as a tool to verify the, uh, um, the pervasiveness of the concept of linguistic error and deviation in describing the linguistic repertoires among, among pupils. To research, for researchers, um, they, uh, we, we think that they will provide uh, very valuable quantitative and qualitative, especially qualitative data uh, for uh, research about uh, uh, language attitudes in particular, language and migration, multilingualism, language contact, and as I was saying before, could also be useful for um, policymakers in designing linguistic policies that are really more consistent and adapt uh, with the different linguistic landscapes that are present in uh, different European schools and universities. So thank you very much. Um, so are there questions for Claudia? Thank you very much, Claudia, for a, a fascinating presentation. Um, and I think a resource family for this would be a, a excellent. Um, because you're dealing with pupils as well, I just wondered what the sort of legal and ethical things are. Have the people who have created the linguistic um, biographies filled in information about informed consent? Or I just wondered how you did deal, dealt with the legal and ethical issues around this fascinating data set. Um, Sylvia, do you want to, to take this? Because Sylvia is the, she's the person who actually collected. Thank you. Uh, with as for the thank you for your question first of all um, since I, I, it was me that I collected the data with pupils we informed the families uh, before working with pupils in schools uh, we prepare legal disclaimer for for them and everyone I have to say that everyone was willing to participate because we after that we uh, we prepare a dissemination event describing all the languages with pupils and families um, that was very much appreciated. So for, for, for pupils, we behave like that. Uh, with university students, we al allow them to uh, anonymize, not, not to insert their names and to decide whether to participate or not. But they were more than 18 years old. <laughs> so thank you. Sorry about uh, Claudia, yeah, also uh, from me, thank you very much for this interesting presentation. I was wondering, um, the collection that you collected, is that from only from Tuscany or is that from whole Italy? Or can you tell me a little bit more about the data and have you analyzed the data? Is there a difference in the way people react if they are uh, male or female, young or older? Do you know already something about that data? 
Silvia Gain. <risa> Or you can come here. Data are coming mostly from Tuscany, uh, but as for adult, uh, adult subjects, they were from all the Italy, from the, the, the nation. As for the um, uh, Norwegian data, they were from Bergen, from students from Bergen. And as for the analysis, um, we start working on the lexical frequency in order to verify the words for dialects, vernacular, for Italian, how they describe their languages. And uh, we uh, put into relationship with uh, mm, production data in order to verify whether there was a mismatch between perception uh, and production. Uh, but we are still working on, on, on collecting. Now we are in the phase of collecting data and analyzing the, a small subset of all, what we already have. Thank you, Arian. Okay, so we now have to move on to the next presentation. So let's thank the speakers. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for the possibility to present uh, our story. Yes, the presentation will be quite different from previous ones since we just wanted to share our story how we became a national center in Latvia. And uh, I will start with a rather old slide from Stephen Grover when he drew plan how Clarin Eric will be implemented. And as you can see, um, well, in 2000, 16, Clarin was already operational. Latvia in 2016 just joined Clarin Eric. And we received funding only at the end of 2018. And thus, in this presentation, I would like to tell our story uh, in, of last five years when we implemented our center. And therefore, since it constitutes of very, very many smaller and bigger steps. The title of our presentation is Clarin LV, Many Steps Still Operation. And of course, 15 minutes are not enough to present all results we have done during these five years with a rather small funding. Therefore, I would like to concentrate mostly on two issues. First of all, building center and repository building it and certification. And on the other hand, I think the most important thing is operation of such center. And for this, we of course need users. And therefore I will speak about our consortium, how we built it and how we collaborate. And the third, but however, still the second aspect are new uh, users and it goes through teaching and training. Similarly to other uh, web, uh, Clarin centers, of course, we have our own website called Clarin LV, and we put news, put uh, uh, different stories here, and it's the access point uh, to repository. And uh, being uh, one of the latest members of Clarin community or Clarin family has some good things. Uh, for instance, uh, when we needed to decide which repository to use or which, uh, how to build our repository. We knew that there are already some good uh, examples. And after considering several pros and cons, we decided to build our repository on base of Clarin Lindat software. And uh, it was because of several reasons. First of all, uh, we saw that it's used by already many centers, so it's reliable. On the other hand, there was very good documentation and also installation process was uh, rather uh, easy. And finally, there is a community which we, we can contact always when we have problems and which helps us in our everyday uh, process. And after installing of a repository, of course, we filled it with language resources and I will tell about it a bit later, but uh, another help we or support we got and how we were um, 
in courage uh, was shock project uh, when we already had our repository and it was filled with language resources and tools we thought well our obligation is to get b center status uh, but uh, process seemed qu quite complicated. And then uh, there came an email from, I think, Daria or somebody else from Claren. Well, there is a shock project which could help you to implement this uh, uh, very long, long documentation. So, and with the uh, help of uh, shock project, we submitted our application. It's still uh, un under investigation, but we hope to receive this status very soon. So uh, moving from technical details to the, the content, uh, our rep repository was um, uh, created uh, at the end of year 2019 and official conference or opening of uh, this repository took place in March 5th, I think, just few days before lockdown. We were so uh, happy about that we managed to do it in that time. Uh, because the, you you need to meet your user in face, not to communicate through a uh, virtual environment. And we also were very thankful to uh, participants from uh, Estonia and Finland who tell, told their stories and helped us to encourage our users to use repository. Speaking about content, uh, it's quite similar to other repositories. Most of the uh, resources are corporate, followed by uh, lexical resources. Currently, there are only two tools. Uh, but if we look a bit closer um, about statistics, uh, currently there are uh, 39 language resources and tools. And just for space reasons, I put uh, top 25, uh, which are currently. So the most popular is dictionary called Tezaurs LV, and I will tell about it a bit later, followed by different versions of Tribunks, balanced corpus of uh, Latvian language, but on the first, fourth place, there is NLP5, which is natural language, Latvian language processing tool chain, allowing uh, users to get uh, morphological uh, annotation or syntactic annotation, as well as mark name identities. And uh, the uh, fourth, uh, fifth one is a historical dictionary of uh, Latvian, but the most important is the sixth one, uh, Latgalian corpus. Latgalian language is dialect or small language in Latvia, but this corpus uh, really is very popular, uh, uh, and as I said, it's number six in our list. Uh, looking a, a bit closer at corporate uh, resources, we have a special site uh, called National Corpus uh, Collection, uh, and name of the site is Corpus LV. Maybe some, some already heard this name during the opening session. And uh, currently there are uh, more than 20 corpora. Most of them are also uh, listed in our repository. The difference is that uh, from Corpora LV site, uh, you usually call or access corpus uh, through sketch engine, while in uh, our repository, if there are no uh, copyright issues, the corpus is uh, downloadable. And of course, we also have our parliament corpus and thanks to parliament, parliament initiative, currently it's also UD annotated and available in Sketch Engine. Um, about lexical resources, as I already said, the central resource is Tezaurs LV. It's a compilation of many Latvian dictionaries uh, work of Andrei Spectors, who maybe some of you uh, remember, uh, for almost 20 years. But today it's state of our dictionary of Latvian. It's used not only by researchers and students, but even my son at school uh, is requested to visit Tezaurs LV if he needs uh, information about some uh, words. And this Tezaurs LV, uh, uh, LV is a central point where you can also access diction other dictionaries of Latvian, like Modern Dictionary of Latvian and Latvian Language Dictionary. And as you can see on screen, there are mo more than 1 million accesses to Tezaurs LV in a month. And uh, finally, uh, I already mentioned tools. 
And you can see this NLP pipeline I mentioned. Uh, what is important bes bef besides this uh, web interface you can uh, see on the screen, which performs morphological annotation, syntactic annotation, and name identity recognition, this pro uh, pipeline is used to process different corpora uh, of Latvian language, and not only corpora developed at our institute, but for instance, Latvian La La uh, La National Library of Latvia currently hosts their own sketch engine instance, and all uh, corpora in this sketch engine instance are annotated with NLP, with help of NLP Pi. Moving to the second important point uh, of my presentation, users, consortium, and teaching. I go back to Corpus LV collection, and here you can see how this Corpus LV collection is actually developed. It's not only work of single institute, it's a collaborative work of our consortium, and a lot of uh, new language resources or elaborated versions of language resources have been developed during last two, two years when digital humanities uh, project has been implemented. Project ended just on Wednesday last week. week. So, uh, but uh, if you can see on screen, uh, the first corpus is a, a corpus of uh, women prosa, and it's developed in collaboration of National Library with Literature and Folklore Institute. And it's in Sketch Engine of National Lib Library, as I said before, of course, a process with NLP pipe. Another corpus, as the last one uh, is this Latgalian corpus, again, new version, and the main partner is uh, Rezek Technology University, and it's it developed again in collaboration with, uh, with, uh, with uh, our institute and uh, resides in yeah, in our sketch engine. Finally, the middle one is old Latvian corpus, which we have and uh, host for a long time. But today we added also the possibility to search for uh, through modern Latvian interface because uh, outside the research community, uh, people don't know so well uh, Latvian language, which was in use uh, for a uh, hundred years ago. So this collaboration through Corpus LV and development of uh, language resources and also annotating them uh, naturally led uh, to our, our consortium building. We had this collaboration already for 20 years, but formally as Clarin Consortium, we established it only at the beginning of this year. Uh, so uh, besides the uh, University of Latvia and dif different institutes of University of Latvia, our consortium also includes National Library of Latvia, Rezek Technology Academy, Lipa University and Rigestradins University. And uh, it's one as aspect of user involvement. Another aspect is dedicated events. And we concentrate on two types of events, conferences, just general introduction, general discussions. The last one was just two days ago on a Thursday and Friday. It was Baltic Dimension Conference. But another type of event we try to in, uh, to use to introduce uh, different aspects to our uh, users are dedicated seminars. And there we concentrate only on one aspect, on one specific topic. And even in COVID time, we managed to make one such virtual uh, event, and it was how to register a language resource in Clarion Repository. You see only few people, but it was on purpose. Uh, just because it was workshop or hands-on session. So we uh, users could follow instructions and do them, themselves this uh, 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 documentation of language resources into repository. And to illustrate, there is just one language resource, uh, this uh, Lithuanian, Latvian, and Latgalian dictionary of our uh, our repository. So we also uh, are part of, uh, of uh, Sophomorean Knowledge Center. I will not tell about it, but I will mention uh, teaching activities. Uh, currently, there are quite a lot different courses at Faculty of uh, Humanities, for mostly for master's students, but uh, we have one special lecture 
who are in, uh, in classrooms uh, for all students. And in uh, this uh, one lecture, we introduced to Clarin repositories, to Clarin resource families, to VLO. So it's just lecture. But after the lecture, we ask students, look at VLO, find resource uh, close to their heart, and present to others in seminar, which is dedicated to Clarin resource resources. And uh, this year findings or my favorites from this year are uh, uh, outcomes from Clarin D, this uh, ASV online toolbox, Ellen uh, annotation tool from Max Planck Institute. And first time uh, students choose one resource from our repository, it's a Latvian language map. To conclude, so we are among the smallest uh, members of uh, Clarion infrastructure and we joined rather late uh, this um, infrastructure and it has some positive and some negative consequences. And as I said, the positive thing is that many administrative technical issues were already solved when we joined project and we could uh, we, we rely on stable solutions, for instance, Linda uh, D space repository software. On the other hand, and it was especially at the beginning, uh, at least we, I felt some gaps uh, because uh, in Stephen Crowers timeline, there was already operational uh, Clarin Eric in Latvia. It was just appointment of me as national co coordinator. But there's these gaps between understanding and readiness and uh, uh, to serve uh, humanities community uh, disappearing and narrowing uh, currently. Finally, uh, yeah, this project uh, we had for setting up Clarin repository will end at the December of this year. However, we already have uh, some new projects in our pocket. Uh, one is called Latte, uh, uh, and it's uh, led by our, the, our user uh, involvement uh, committee member, Ilse Housinger, and it's uh, dedicated to development new language resources and tools. And two other projects are currently under uh, review. One is a uh, continuation project of, of digital humanities uh, resources, and another one is uh, uh, speci specially dedicated uh, to uh, the development of high-level skills in language technologies, and it goes uh, under uh, umbrella of Latvia's recovery and sustainability plan. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much, Inguna, for this fascinating picture of the state of language technology clarin resources in Latvia. I see a question already. Oh. Thanks a lot for this inspiring talk. Uh, I am speechless with uh, your progress. I remember when we first met and where you were then and after this presentation. I only have one question for you, which is, um, what would your advice be for a new similar small consortia like yours to maximize on your experience and how could they follow your success? What steps should they avoid? Uh, what have you learned and would try uh, to persuade them not to engage in? I think the most important is use power of Clarin Eric Consortium as such, because a lot of the, uh, good things were done before we started to do, and it's not necessary to start everything from zero. It's better to use good experience from others. And going back, Daria, to you, I, I remember uh, this Clarin uh, teaching issue, which I asked you when I, because we already uh, teach it, uh, and uh, well, and that was our collaboration. Thank you. Are there other questions from the audience? Thank, thanks very much indeed. Indeed, it, you've made excellent progress. I wondered if you could say, if I'd understood correctly, the Lindat, you, the colleagues in the Czech Republic, the colleagues in the Czech Republic um, 
shared their repository with you and helped you set that up. Could you say a little more about that to see, because it's really interesting to see other countries helping each other um, like that. Well, actually, uh, Linda's repository is on GitHub, and everybody can use. It's not. Uh, <laughs> it's a, and there is a specific uh, working group uh, working on development of new version, and yeah. So uh, yeah, and we also consulted uh, uh, Linda's colleagues when we set uh, set it up, and still consulting through Slack. <laughs> so there's time for one short question before we move on. Uh, well, I have one. What, so you already have an impressive array of resources and tools. What would be on your for, uh, the top priority on your wish list for the next resource or tool for Latvian? Well, it's uh, I don't remember now name of a new project uh, Jan introduced on Baltic HLT uh, conference, but uh, on our list uh, there is this uh, language models. Uh, because we miss, we have only birth <laughs> currently. And I mentioned Jan Harich because uh, he has now new Horizon project, which actually aims to develop language models for all 24 languages, if I remember correctly, but uh, he's not here anymore. Yeah. Okay. I don't remember name, something on age. <laughs> so thank you once again. <laughs>